Welcome to this episode of Let's Be Civil. Joining me today on Let's Be Civil is Andreas Carvalho. Andreas Carvalho is CEO and founder of the strategic planning firm CMG Consulting LLC. He is also a professor of innovation in the College of Science and Engineering and co-director of the Cedar Consortium at Texas State University. He has authored nearly 40 books, including the bestseller, The Advanced Smart Grid, Edge Power, Driving Sustainability. Welcome everybody to another uh, edition of Let's Be Civil, uh, the civil engineering podcast, all about civil engineers and the people that work with them and get irritated by them. And that's, that's one of the people I'm talking with today. Andreas is not a civil engineer. He wishes he was. He's a, he, he, I, I know um, when we go out to lunch and do things like that, he's telling me, God, I screwed up. I took the wrong career path. Um, no, he's actually somebody that that works with a lot of different people, some of which are uh, civil engineers, but I don't know that that's as big of a deal here as this is a guy who um, has got a very interesting career. Um, and, I, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. When you were working um, on Windows, I was using Windows. Mm -hmm. And I think I told you before, 3.1. So, I, you know, I mean, I don't know what, what version, you know, you were involved with. But I was sitting in my office as the sole guy at the University of Arkansas Civil Engineering Department that had a computer that ran Windows of any sort. And so I was the guinea pig. Um, I will tell you, and, you know, that you, can, you can poke me at some other time. I was at a Macintosh sitting next to my PC because the one thing I couldn't do on my PC was draw very much. And, and using the, the old, the original Mac, I could do graphics, you know, f uh, uh, much more easily. So, so that was another thing that made me d distinguish me from everybody else is I had two different kinds of computers in my office and the other faculty would walk by going, why does this guy have two, you know, and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, <laughs> without further ado, we have somebody with us today that, uh, I mean, this, this will be a fun 30 minutes. We'll have, we may have to have, you, you know, you may need to be my Andy Richter. I'll be Conan O'Brien and you can be Andy Richter or something <laughs> like that. And, and then, you know, people will, will chime in and say, yeah, you two need to be a team um, and go on the road and do this. So, Andreas, welcome to to Let's Be Civil, and you know, start start talking to me. Tell tell me your life story for the umpteenth time. I've I've heard it a million well, times, but it doesn't get old. Me, you know the one. I, I I have to tell you that I love the name. I love the name. Let's be civil. That's very good, very clever. You know, I'm a creative guy. It's also, it's also, uh, and, you know, where we're heading with infrastructure automation, intelligence and all that is, is, is very good because, um, you know, I think civil engineers like energy and air and water are kind of taken for granted. You know, they're there, they deliver all the stuff. But nobody thinks about it, right? Nobody thinks about how many bridges am I going to grow over this day today? How many, how many miles or how many, you know, how many roads am I going to drive through? Or, you know, we just do these things and we take it for granted, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's like when you talk about, you know, I turn around and all I see is civil engineering everywhere, right? So most people don't think that way, right? So, so my career is an interesting path, you know, to, uh, to, to hear, but I, you know, when I was little, I always knew that I wanted to be an engineer, and, and my fascination with engineering came from working with Legos. So obviously, the first things that you build with Legos are little houses, and 
little roofs and things like that. And then if you get sophisticated, you make buildings and, and things like that. But then, you know, the Legos got really creative because they started adding moving parts so you can make little vehicles with wheels and little tires and things. And, and so the fascination with making cars also became a big driver. And so I wanted to be an engineer. So when I, when the time came to study engineering after uh, going to high school and in high school, you know, I, I love science. So I, I took five chemistry, five physics, five math. Uh, you know, I took, I, you know, my, my high school was a five year high school when I went to it and uh, it was Catholic school. And, um, and I was fascinated with building things and I was always in the lab tinkering with things. And, you know, one of my biggest uh, accomplishments was I discovered what sulfur nitrate does when it touches water. And, and I blew up a toilet in, in school, you know, just, just to see how much it would take to blow up the toilet. Uh, so, <laughs> so I was, I was always tinkering with things. And, uh, but when it came time to study, you know, Oh, like what we're doing now and what you're doing now at Texas State, which is really, you know, the beginning of a new dawn, right, where, where a civil engineer at Texas State would be equipped to really not only be um, a civil engineer, but really be the architect of a new future of devices and, and infrastructures interacting and talking and managing and, and collaborating to, to enable a future that is way, way better than what we have today. Um, um, th 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 those were not choices when I, when we grew up, right? So you had to pick a, a single lane, kind of purposely driven, focused lane of what to be when you grow up. So when I looked at all those choices, I actually, you know, was very enamored with computers and, and robotics. And, and I loved uh, the whole notion of uh, control systems, managing things, you know, making sure that things did what they were supposed to do. So. So that drove me to picking mechanical engineering, uh, which I call it the liberal arts of engineering because when you're a mechanical engineer, you learn about, you know, the fixed structures and dynamics and moving structures and you learn about lift and aerodynamics and you learn about combustion engines and you learn about thermodynamics and you learn about stress and materials. And, and so you really learn about all the disciplines in many ways and, and so, um, and so, again, you know, I, I graduated focused on, on robotics and control systems, uh, which, you know, forced me to become a software guy, even though, you know, again, I did not have a minor in software, but I had learned to program in C and Fortran and APL and a bunch of other uh, machine learning languages as we were, you know, cutting things, you know, and, and blowing things. And, and, and so on. And uh, so of all things, after wanting to go work for Ford Motor Company, that was sort of my dream job to go be a auto designer of sorts. And you, you don't really get that job day one. You have to earn your way into it. And maybe it would have taken me 30 years to get that job at Ford. But, but I was going to be a, a, you know, an apprentice uh, in an accelerated program they had for new graduates. And um, so anyway, so that never happened. Um, you know, I got cross-sighted by a company called Microsoft, and uh, and I got to meet Bill Gates. Um, you know, six months before I graduated, and uh, and they offered me a job to come work for them and run Windows and be the first product manager for Windows before Windows existed. So I did versions one, two, and three, and then a protocol. You know, Windows for Word groups and a protocol Windows 386 for the Compact 386 machine that came out in 1987. Um, uh, so I worked at Microsoft from 86 through 89, left in 89. Um, in that journey, we had a phenomenal transformation, went from $100 million in sales to a billion dollars in sales. Uh, and we kind of killed all the competition. So uh, Windows was a big part of that. I help build the ecosystem of companies like PageMaker and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, I forget the names. There are like 40 applications that we help bootstrap from scratch. And, and then the biggest thing we had to do is we, we had to really create the, the market uh, mechanism to get to the consumers and the businesses. And so we, 
actually help bootstrap things like business land and computer land and, and all this kind of, you know, uh, it's stores that would sell computer software that back in the day didn't exist as an item, as a category when you walked into a mall or anything right. like that. Um, so, you know, from in that, in that computer software journey, I learned a lot. The biggest thing about it, uh, John, for software point of view, as it relates to going into the future with AI and managing sensors and getting analytics and, 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 and driving outcomes, if you will, uh, that you want to control. And software is really the glue of everything else. So, so you know, when you're a mechanical engineer, you learn about all these hardware things and systems and stuff. And same in civil or in electrical, you're managing hardware components and structures and and how the structures are made and created and solder or curated or you know the, the steel and and the concrete pour and stuff. But but the software element, uh, you know, as a as a practice it's really important for the engineer to, to, to master, right? And so, so you know, I don't think you have to um, get a double degree or anything like that. And, you know, if you can, if you can afford it, that would be an advantage, but all you have to do is just work long hours at night and on weekends to teach yourself to program. And the biggest thing about it is, you know, learning the architectures and learning how to, how to manage sort of the systems of systems kind of thing. I don't know if that makes sense. That's nope, nope. For, the, for the opening, right? So, so how do you so how do you end up then from from that? Let's let's go from that to, to you know do a quick jump to today. How do you how do you go from yeah. being well, Microsoft so the journey, to, to the journey? Yeah, yeah. So the journey is that I end up working with two other companies after Microsoft in the software industry. So I do eight years of software. And, 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 and then I get hired away by a hardware company, Digital Equipment Corporation in Boston. They have looked at my career and I have built now multiple software businesses uh, beyond Microsoft at Borland and at SEO as general manager, very young general manager in the 30, my 30s. And, um, and Digital Equipment was trying to enter the personal computer industry for the fifth time after failing four times doing what we call proprietary personal computers. And now they were doing one that was based on Intel and Microsoft and open standards and all that. And, and so I got hired by, you know, a couple of compact guys that had went to work for, for DEC and, uh, and I was uh, president of the Americas. And, um, and uh, so I built for them a $2 billion business making computers and I was GM and, I'd always been a product guy, so really not a sales and marketing guy, even though I've learned that over the years, but I was really more of a, a product guy, focused on products, features, pricing, market segmentation, positioning, you know, benefits, you know, basically how to how to create the right right widget and how to sell the right widget. And so I build, you know, notebook computers and servers and 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 desktop. So learn heavy duty manufacturing. Uh, had three manufacturing plants under me, had some 4,000 employees working for me, had offices in 15 countries. So so then I switched to another hardware company, Philips Electronics, to make telecom uh, devices, so cell phones. And I made um, you know analog and um, digital phone people being a TDMA and CDMA for the telecom people listening or they understand that, build the first CDMA phones in the world. And, in, in Texas, in Dallas, and um, in CDMA is a standard that is underneath LTE and everything we're using this day. It's curated by Qualcomm and AT&T. And, and, um, and so, when, so if you think about it, I, I worked on software, then worked on computers, then worked on telecom. And those are the three ingredients that you need to add to any kind of infrastructure to make it intelligent. Uh, so my first, my first, my first choice of an in infrastructure industry to go into was energy. So I went into energy right after that um, and became the chief information technology officer at the power company in Austin called Austin Energy, and drove a transformation of four billion dollars in eight years that resulted in many things. One of those things is the creation of the very first smart grid in the world, and um, and then. Did four startups uh, in telecom, uh, and 
and then ended up where I am today. Working. Yeah, it stuck working with me. Yeah, working at Texas. But it's really a full circle when you think about it, right? Because I've been what I call a practitioner. And I think over time, when you become really good practitioner, then you become what is called a seer or a visionary, right? You're one of those. Yeah. And so you start, because you see, you've seen so much and you understand patterns, you start having this magical sense of inching up into the future. You can see around the corner before other people can. And you start really saying, oh, this is a need. This, this is going to happen a couple of years from now. We should be working on this. We should be doing research on that, right? And so, so the, the, that's really, so for me, you know, having been in those four industries, I have a, you know, and having you know, always been a, a product guy, pretty deep in technology, I have a very unique ability to see around the corners. Right, right, right. right. And we're at a time when we need to do that. I mean, it, it, yeah. and, and when I say we're at a time, this is not a COVID-19 time. This is a 2020 right. time. That, that that we need to do this, which you and I have been talking about since 2017, um, you know, give or take. Well, you, you know, I, I have done, I've done some more work on, on why this is happening, John, in our timely, in our, 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 you know, the time for us being at, with the experience and the age and the knowledge that we have at this time is pretty powerful because so, so one of the data points that justifies what's happening and why you and I have been looking around the corner and become kindred brothers on the, all this is, you know, it's really funny. Corporate America, United States, have been investing their money primarily on buying shares of their own stock back. In fact, I think in the last 10 years, the amount of, buyback of stocks in terms of billions of dollars or trillions of dollars is basically a hundred times more than any amount invested in R and D by the same companies. And because so, what that, so what that says, John, is that we are running on a runway in the current innovation track of how things are done based on the paradigms that were invented really 50, 80 years ago. And now a new way of educating, learning, uh, researching, mm -hmm. building things. It needs to be built, built, designed, you know, right. Uh, right. enabled, right? right? And so it's, so it's really, you know, it's really, they, 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 over the last six months, I've been uh, paying attention to a lot of things and I came into this data point. And isn't it fascinating that, Corporate America is just not investing in innovation as much as they should anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's because probably they don't see the results. They don't trust their people, right? And everybody is kind of still doing things the old fashioned way and it doesn't work anymore. This, right. is, why we need, this is why we need TEI right. and we need civil engineers to learn about software and sensors. And, and so how does that come about, right? How do you shift that? Right. Yeah. Well, one thing that you said that I think is is significant um, is that you picked things up along the way, not because you were necessarily looking for the knowledge or the skill set, um, but that you saw some value in something and and, and stuff pieced together. Yeah. Essentially. You you didn't go you you didn't decide to become a mechanical engineer and then you put blinders on and said here's what a mechanical engineer does and so this is what I'm going to do. You right. you allowed yourself to be open to what was going on around you and that openness created doors for you that you know would certainly not have occurred if you were doing this right. And um, correct. And correct. so so one of the things that's fascinating to me about the, you know, a person like yourself in your career is by not putting on the blinders, by actually absorbing the information that was available around you, uh, just you kept building a skill set that, that not only allowed you to look around the corners, but to do it uniquely, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and I think, I think, I think if I, if I, to, to, to elaborate on your point is I think somehow, and now I see it clearly, but 
I think somehow I developed an appreciation or an early understanding of the significance of disruptions. And when a disruption was presented to me and explained so I could understand it like windows, then I really, really value the possibility of that disruption and then develop the interest of being, in, uh, of being part of it. So, so this is, um, so you made another interesting comment that um, you, had, you basically had to understand it. So it's one thing to, to, to take the blinders off and let stuff happen around you. But if you can't, if you don't have a way to pull that stuff together and understand it and say, um, how am I going to use this and go forward with it? Then it's just information. Correct. But, but another part of that is you also said you now understand today what was happening before you didn't necessarily understand it before. So another piece, yes. this takes time. You don't become somebody yes. that can look around a corner six months after you're graduating college, you know, or, or right. you know, it, you had to be exposed to a lot of things. You had to sort of piece the things together. Um, and mm -hmm. you, you didn't necessarily understand, you know, as you do today, why and how it was all going to come together. But eventually it does. So, I, you know, for me, listening to you, what I'm hearing is don't, don't constrain yourself. Don't do it to yourself. Other people might do it to you. Um, and then you might want to look for a different job. But don't, if you constrain yourself, boy, you, you've really limited where you can go. Would you agree? Yeah. Well, yeah. And I, and I think that, uh, again, you know, oh, you know, call it, call it Providence, call it, you know, pre-programmed DNA, call it being dumb, call it, you know, you know, uh, being, uh, you know, just a uh, risk taker, but, uh, you know, whatever you want to pick, um, you know, you, you sometimes it's easy to pick the easy path uh, to the outcomes that you think could happen versus, uh, you know, a new path with, you know, unknown outcomes. And, and so one of the things that was always fascinating to me, um, I grew up, my dad was a, a journalist and my mom was a psychologist. So we, you know, it was easy, it was easy to say that, there was a lot of reading going on in my house. So I read a lot and I read a lot of history. I took five years of history in, in high school. Um, and um, and uh, so it was, I always was always fascinated by this, the sort of the ability of the, you know, the superstars in history from, you know, you name it, you know, mm. the conquerors to the emperors of the old days to, the Napoleons and the whoever's of the current modern times to to, to the you know uh, FDRs and World War II and you know and, and Churchill and the like and and it would and so one of the things that I now preach on when I talk to uh, youth of, uh, looking for their future is um, we all we all strive for success. And we, I would argue that we all define success differently based on who we are and, you know, what our, our background is and our economic possibilities. And so what's really successful for a lot of people, success for a lot of people may not be success for others. And, and that's not the point. The point is what's more important than, than being successful is how does success happen? How do I... How do I go to a poker game and win every night in a row? How do I, how can I hit, you know, and, and I grew up being a Yankee fan. My dad was a phenomenal Joe DiMaggio fan. And how do I hit, uh, hit 56 games in a row? You know, I, you know, how, how do I do that? How do I, and so one of the things that I, I, I kind of synthesize it like this, success happens when opportunity meets preparation. So back to the point of understanding, the only, I don't control success. I don't control the opportunities. The only thing I can control is my own preparation. So I've always been enamored with mastering. And mastering means 
you got to do something for 10,000 hours until you really, really dominate. Right. Right. That's why there is no secret that a master's, which is two years, comes after in the undergraduate school, which is four years, because roughly a master of, of going to school and spending time is 10,000 hours. Right? So, so mastering whatever you want to do and really being in the midst, in the middle of it. The other thing about it is, you know, for in, in, in you'll, you'll uh, realize, you know, agree with this being one of those, but when you are an innovator and you are a visionary and you're sitting and you're surrounded by the people who are doing the same that you are, you are really what I call, you know, I love water sports. You are on the, on the wake of in the foam of the wave behind the boat, wakeboarding, wake surfing, what have you. And when you are on the, on the, on the wake, on the back of the boat, right when the surf is happening, right with, at the very edge of the beginning of the wave, you see things in a totally different light than you would when you are 50 feet behind the wave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I saw things when I stepped off of a U-Haul truck and twisted my ankle and that's that and the, and the pain that ratcheted through my body. Then that's when I saw things. <laughs> the, the visions of the, the, you know, seeing your life pass before you in front of your eyes. But no, I, 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 I follow you exactly. Um, it's, yeah. it's, it's I, what I, what I would like to, to make sure we kind of leave with the, with the listeners is, um, you, you have to let yourself be open to the possibilities yeah. that, that come along. Um, and, and, and you just and don't know be, where you're going to go. Really and be thirsty for knowledge, right? Yeah. Because again, you don't control success. You don't control the opportunities. You only thing you control is preparation. So you got to keep sharpening your saw. Now, the more you sharpen your saw and the more you learn about different things, software, hardware, telecom, energy, what have you, then your optics and your understanding of other patterns and new opportunities and the ability to recognize those opportunities enhances dramatically, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of mm -hmm. like, you know, you, you got a better kind of radar, you got a better kind of, you know, amplification right. Of, right. of understanding what's happening around you. So, so, you know, if you're just a civil engineer focused on structures and don't pay attention to anything else, and the anything else is, I don't know, building flexible roads that will conquer the world and no longer be sitting on earth, but just be flexible roads floating around because somehow we will figure out how to use lift and gravity uh, right. to the favor of the roads being flexible and floating around. Uh, I'm just making this up. No, but, no, no, you know, you. Unless you're open, unless you're open, right, minded, and then yeah. unless you're thirsty to go and figure this out, you're not going to go there. Yeah, yeah. And I think the other thing that you, you would agree with is, People are going to tell you, no, it can't be done. We, you know, the, you know, my favorite one is we don't do it that way, or we have never right. done it that way. That's my favorite, you know, because, um, yeah. you know, I consider myself the we we've never done it that way guy. Because <laughs> I'm always, yeah. you know, um, you can't you can't let that deter you. you know, Correct. I mean, the, the answer back is well, why not? You know, or or then let's find a way. You know, because that's yeah, that's, that's and that is and that is exactly and that is exactly what's driving the vision of Cedar Connected Infrastructure uh, Research that we're doing at Texas State that you and I started. That that is like why not reimagine the future of infrastructure like for everything? You know, why are windows rectangular? Why do windows have frames? Why are water? Why are doors rectangular? Why do we? Why do they open in a in a hinge back and forth? You know, in the day of COVID, it'd be awesome if there were no doors with doorknobs and they would open automatically like on the space uh, enterprise. Or get you know, smart for the... Yeah. If you're old enough, get right? smart. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah little, so, hey, you know, I just thought about it. Little I, did they know what that meant. That's get right. Smart. That's right. I never just thought about that. Huh. Yeah. Well, we're, we're, we are go ahead. We, we're, we are in a very unique time, John, yeah. very yeah. unique time. And, 
And so I, you know, honestly, between you and me and, 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 and the audience listening, I wish I was 24 years old, 23 years old, just getting out of college. You, 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 the, next, the, the, next, the next 50 years are going to be unbelievable. Yeah. You, you said that, the, you know, this is the dawn, you know, of a new day. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I believe that, you know, the things are going to transform in, in significant ways. Um, uh, you know, in, in, our, in our lifetime, we've seen, um, we, we've seen Walkmans come and go. You know, I mean, we've we've seen some some pretty you know significant technology come and go along the way, um, and and it's kind of been leading up to, uh, at least for from a civil engineering perspective, to this moment in time. Stuff being able to be made smaller, uh, things being able to be uh, wireless, um, you know, the ac remote access and stuff, and um, I mean. You don't just get to where we are today overnight and it just snap of the fingers, things change. Um, but but I mean, I mean, maybe this is part of like what you were getting to earlier. You know, we've been around to see those things and to understand them. And you can mm -hmm. start to, to put them together in a way that, um, you know, if nothing else, we're going to be at the front end of, you know, the, these transformations and the, the dawn of a new era. So it's that, that part of it is pretty exciting if all the good oh, stuff yeah. happens after us, right? <laughs> so. uh, well, you know, just, just being able to go out with a bang as, as we are truly, you know, and, and maybe there is something to be said for the first hundred years of a new century kind of thing, where, you know, there's a transition happening and clearly we're in the middle of that or just beginning, you know, maybe we're 20 years, 30 years into it since the computer and, and networking came about and the internet was born. Uh, you know, the gig economy is the early stages of that, right? So, so things like blockchain and how that, you know, enables a new way of doing things with software and managing assets and tracking things and the AI. And, and, and it just, I think you and I, the many times that we have talked about dreaming the pieces that we can bring to now, uh, we we just kind of you know smile right because I mean ninety percent of what's going to happen we cannot imagine but right. we know it's coming and we can feel it you know? yeah 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 well sir gotta gotta call it a, a day here um, looking forward to when we can get back together again even though we're not that physically far apart um, be able to go out to lunch and, and hang out a little bit and. Uh, go for rides in each other's cars because you know we're missing out on on that. So and, and we may have to wait a while to go for a ride in your car. We'll we'll violate the closeness rule for a long time on that one. But um, yeah, no, I I I I I do miss I do miss hanging out. But no. but you know the one thing I think there is a really important short term benefit for COVID nineteen, like any other pandemic, but abroad, it is that it has. It has forced the old guard, the guard that is in control of the world, it has forced them to rethink and reevaluate the need for full digitalization, full automation, a new construct of how to do things yep. that will really you know, uh, uh, come back and, and enable you know, a lot of things sooner rather than later. Yep. Yep. that, um, you know, it might have taken 10, 15, 20 years. Now it's going to happen in the next three or four. Yeah, and with a lot less screaming and, and moaning and groaning uh, by those that were, were right. would have been uh, opposed, at least initially, to, to some of the changes there. It's, it's that those hurdles are going to be f fewer and lower uh, right. than, they, than they would have been otherwise. All right, sir. Thanks for being uh, my latest guest on Let's Be Civil. And uh, I think what we're going to need to do at some point in time is we're going to stand out there outside of where you're sitting and we're going to get the body cam and helmet cams and we're going to look over, you know, diagonal across that property and we're going to see a research facility coming out of the ground that, you know, may look like other research facilities uh, from the exterior, but what's going to be going on inside of that thing is going to be 
really, really unique and fascinating. And that, that's going to be a lot of fun when, when we can get to, to that. Point. Absolutely. All right, man. Take it easy. I, I Enjoy talking forward, with you. I look forward to that. Thank yep. you. Yep. See you later.